Welcome to the Transformative Principle Podcast. I am so excited for this second part of the interview with J.M. from D Elementary. First of all, we are going to pick up where we left off, where she talks about implementing procedures and plans that become habits for your students. Then we're going to learn about how she balances her life, and we're going to hear what she has hanging in her office that most principals probably don't have hanging. If you have questions about this podcast, feel free to follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones or send me an email at jethrojones at gmail.com. And I would like to thank our sponsor for this episode, Paperless Principle. Please go to paperlessprinciple.com to learn how you can ditch the clutter in your life, streamline your workflow, and be more efficient. of what looks like, sounds like, charts look like, and then how they would create them for their room and how they would teach our procedures that we have for our whole building and then what they were going to set as the first five uh, habits of their classroom Mm -hmm. and how they were going to teach it. And we had these plans. Then we brought the rest of our support team in and did the same thing. Okay. Then the first two weeks of school, we did not do instruction of any kind of math yes. language arts. I know. <laughs> we did looks like, sounds like, and we did the Navy way. Mm-hmm. You um, demonstrate the wrong way. You model the right way. You practice the right way mm-hmm. after you do the looks like, sounds like. And we did that. for Every single procedure in the building at practicing. Mm-hmm. Then we did it for every single habit in the classroom and procedure. And then they started to integrate curriculum. And then they would stop the curriculum. Any time they had to go back and practice it. Because our, mo- our mantra is never pass or wrong. Address mm-hmm. it both professionally and positively. That's a hard one. Because mm-hmm. you have to really change yourself. Okay? Yeah, I love that. And, that's great. And so the first two weeks we, we were behind in curriculum. They would try to integrate it a little bit as they could, but that was the main focus. And then we, after the first two weeks, we were integrating the curriculum back in, but then we would stop. And then every grade, by week, the end of week three, had met their performance goal that they had set for procedures and earned their school shirt, except for one grade. They were tough. Mm-hmm. And, and due to the makeup, and they were our high flyers, too. In previous years, a lot of our high flyers of the frequent kids that caused the issues. And so their teachers stuck strong and were committed to it. And we gave them some extra support with myself and my counselor and extra, oh, excellent, you know, extra additional praising, practicing, you know. And we even had some rebels that would try to uh, distract and resist. We had resistors. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Fifth grade resistors. Fifth, no way. <laughs> they would start to just clap just to throw it off because they were so just, they were not going to do it, you know. And so um, some choice suspensions with parent meetings with myself and the counselor. And we'd already been in a classroom several times and could right. address each one exactly. And the parent, so the parent support was there. And we brought them back. We made a couple changes and shifts of combinations. And by week four, fifth grade started to comply. They still are, are they need a lot of practice. And their teachers have to be very tight and sharp. They can't ever give it in at all and ignore anything. Mm-hmm. They have got to follow sticks. In fact, all of my staff is very good at not ignoring anything not passing a wrong. But there's not as many opportunities as there is in fifth grade. Right. Yeah. And so they have still been committed to that, and it is starting to pay off for them. But it, yeah. it's now November. Yeah. So it's not easy. No, certainly not. And I'm sure those first four weeks were incredibly long. For it was. For you, for the teachers. It was. But, it, but the other grades were celebrating. Like, I... For example, my kindergarten. We have full day kindergarten. We have two classes. We have 30 and 31. Okay, in a full day class. And think of our kindergartners. They don't 
they come at with no reading skills, no letter skills, nothing. Okay, color, shapes, most of them. I had six that did, and their others did not. And um, we started them a half day the first month so they could teach them the procedures with half of the kids. So you had half the kids come in the morning, so uh-huh. 15 and, and half, 15. Yes, so they would have a smaller size. That's, that's and really at the end of September, we made it full day. Mm-hmm. And it's been the smoothest transition. And so all of my grades by October, kindergarten through fourth, and then sixth, the teachers were celebrating mm-hmm. because it's the calmest learning and the, uh, the best learning environment they've had. And they could go much quicker with their instruction. It was just my fifth that took a little bit longer. And even though they are seeing now a month later that they are able to go faster because they finally have it with just a few things here and there. It's still tough, but they, they still have struggled with small group. They're the one grade that does not release the kids into the small group learning as frequently because that it tells them to be independent learners and able to stay on target and do what they need to do in their small group and act appropriately with the procedures. And they still can't do that. They can do it in a whole group setting, which is fascinating. Not quite yet in a small group. You would think that in small group, you'd be able to control them. a little. Well, bit you don't better. have an adult for every small group, right? So you have mm-hmm. multiple small groups throughout the room mm-hmm. and the teacher's monitoring them. Right. And, that that requires a high level of responsibility on the students yeah, to stay absolutely. on task. So if you have a group of kids that are really not wanting to make that commitment quite yet, mm-hmm. we're still in that stage, and it's and it's it's the end of November, mm-hmm. and they've got them whole group. They've got them when they divide them up into two different groups in their class. But if they do multiples like four or five groups, they can't yeah. continue that for more than twenty minutes, and only one time during the day. It's just knowing where your kids are at, but, um, and I tell them it's okay because the learning that is taking place is high quality and doing very well. Instead of saying, well, everyone else is doing two times of small group learning. We need to do it and having a a failure out of control. They do it the wise way. They do what the kids can handle with keeping true to the procedures. So that's, that's a common thing that I'm sensing through everything that you're doing, that you give teachers and students what they can handle and what they're able to do while pushing them but not making it so that it's so difficult for them to achieve that that Mm -hmm. they have no hope of succeeding you give them just enough and with your observations and your feedback Mm -hmm. you give them just enough that they're pushed but not so much that well i'm never going to accomplish that you want quick wins you want Mm -hmm. a quick win every week or two weeks and then you have that success and they master it and then you move on. That That's exactly it. And it's knowing where your data is, is what is the key skills that leverage the, the biggest outcome. And that's what you want to s- select as your skills. I mean, if it's a minute skill that the student's never really going to use, is that what you're going to spend most of your time on? Or are you going to spend time on the skill that they still haven't mastered and it's a foundational skill and they've got to get that? So I'm going to put my energy there and get them success there because if they don't get that skill, nothing else, they won't be able to understand anything else. So that's what my teachers do, and that's why they're able to successfully move significant numbers of kids to proficiency because that's what they target. And they use their time very purposefully and they, they um, design the activities to get the greatest outcome and, and leverage. So let's talk a little bit about um, teacher morale, turnover, how it sounds like there's a lot going on here all mm-hmm. the time. And it sounds like you, like I said, you push your teachers. Um, well, I push them hard. Really hard, right? And um, how do you keep them motivated? How do you... Um, hire the right people. I mean, this is a, a much longer discussion that we have mm-hmm. time for, but give me some insight into how you keep them motivated and how you find the right people to come here when you do have turnover. You know, I've had a lot of people ask. In fact, my, my superintendent even asked. He said, it was JM, you push your people really hard. And he said, I am really surprised you don't have the turnover. He goes, and yet I look at other buildings that, you know, have great leaders 
and that they're really well liked. He goes, and they're friendly, you know, and, and he goes, and I think, oh, I think it's just wonderful. They have huge turnover. He goes, why do you not have it? And, you know, I don't have the answer other than this is what I've come up with is, is my, my, my folks know that, um, my ultimate goal is what's best for all of our kids. And I want them as individuals to be a success and the, as great as they can be. And I will do anything I can to help them to be successful. But I'm going to expect a lot because whatever our kids need, we have to make it happen. It's kind of like we're going to the moon and make it happen. You know, how are we going to get there guys? Right. We're just, we're, we're going to get there. You make it happen. So, we're going to get a hundred percent. Now let's make it happen. What is it that you're going to have to do that you have control over that you're going to do? What do I need to do to help support you to make that happen? And we're in this together and I don't have all the answers. They may not have all the answers, but together we'll get into people that we need to, to find the answers and we'll make it happen. But, um, I will I will give, I ask nothing of them that I won't be willing to do myself. I give lots of time. I, I'm sending emails at 2, 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. I'm doing things for them, typing up data so they don't have to do it. You know, anything I can do to make their job easier, I will. But we got to give it because our kids need it. And I think it goes back to all of the attention and the time with meetings and listening to them and hearing what are some concerns, what do they think is best with instruction, but that all comes into play. That you know what? Yeah, I work my butt off here, they're gonna say it to themselves, but look at what the the difference I make in the kids, plus I get I get a say. And I get the freedom to do what I need to do as long as I get the results. And it meets the, our criteria that, that we've all agreed to. Mm -hmm. And I do what I need to do as a team. And you establish those expectations mm -hmm. from the very beginning. So nobody yeah. comes here thinking that that those expectations are any different than what you want them to be. Right. right. And they know that I want them to be the greatest. Mm -hmm. And some of them have even, have even said that I work really hard here. But I don't want to be anyplace else because you help me to be better. You know, and I had a person leave because um, she wanted to teach easier kids. And she even told me, she said, I need an easier place to teach. But she gave me a hug and she said, thank you. You helped me grow a lot. But this just isn't the right place for me. I need it easier. Yeah. I have to work too hard. And that was okay. We're okay with that. If someone feels that they need to leave for that, and that happened two years ago, I'm okay with that. But she gave me a hug and she left. And and that's a great testament to you setting up that culture and the expectation for your teachers because they know how hard they have to work. And if they're okay with that, they'll be happy to stay. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, then they can choose to leave and know that you're not going to bag on them behind their back right. or think poorly of them because they made that choice. Right. And and I think that that is something that um, that I've heard from teachers that say, well, if I can't do this, then that principal is going to hate me or not like mm -hmm. me or whatever. And and I don't get that impression from you, and I'm sure your teachers don't yeah. either. You know, and and I'd like to say that uh, that is true. You know, mm -hmm. um, that uh, we have that trust with each other, and I praise them a lot. And I will be honest with them when there's a concern or honest when we need to look at something, there's a growth. But no one's in trouble. It's it's like, oh, this is just something we gotta work on. And let's make it a focus and let's and let's and let's uh, set our goal for ourselves and let's get this mastered. And it's a day to day ongoing process. It doesn't mean that you don't have bumps in the roads. You know, you get frustrated people, but it's how you handle it, you know. And the biggest thing is, is everyone knows that everything is transparent. 
same expectation of everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a staff assistant, cook, custodian, or full-time classroom teacher, or a secretary, or even myself. It's the same expectation. We got to do whatever it takes to provide the best and safest learning environment and get our kids at, at grade level and higher. So they will go to college. That's that's our goal. And we we have it takes enormous effort because we've lost funding with SIG. You lose staff with that. Yet you can't lose services. You cannot lose and adjust systems that are working. You have to maintain them and then even refine and strengthen them with less people and less money and still make bigger gains once the big money's gone. And my staff's committed to that. And we're doing it. And that's amazing because even schools that don't have all those extra resources, still some of them cannot get behind that vision and, and be on that path. So you talked a little bit about sending emails at 2, 3, 4 in the mm -hmm. morning. Um, talk to me about how you manage your time and how much time you spend working and um, and how you find balance in your life, too, because if it's all work and no play. That's, that's the hard one, let me tell you. Um, I've set up my day to where the bulk of my time is either with, well, two days a week are PLCs. Mm -hmm. That's Tuesday and Wednesday. And so you have... Monday, Thursday, and Friday to do your observations. And keep in mind that from 11.30 to 1.15 every day is lunch, mm -hmm. cafeteria, duty. And you're in there. Myself and my counselor. And so other than the PLC days. And so that takes a big chunk out of your time. And so the rest of my time is split between observing teachers and doing what I need to do at school. So that's where getting caught up on my emails because like I'll scan and I hit the highlight ones, see those during the day, but I've got to get caught up. And so at times I'll pick a couple different nights a week and I'll just stay up later and do the emails because then you have to fit in uh, your reports, all that stuff. And we've like, a as a district, they've, we've tried to do, um, implement how Paul Banbury, um, Sent, sorry, Santoya does an observer tracker to do that. And so they tried that one and we did it on the laptop, but it wasn't user friendly because I take an iPad when I do observations. Mm -hmm. So then to be able to submit it to the district, I'd have to then find the time to retype it all up. Right. So it's doubling, you know. Mm -hmm. And so just, just a week ago, the tech, they kind of got it worked out. And he downloaded it onto my iPad, and it syncs to my laptop. Hallelujah. But now I have to just transfer everything over to the iPad. That's what I'll do over Thanksgiving break. So then I'm up to date. So then I can go in the classroom, send my observation running record to the teacher, and make the little notes, and it's done. But there's there's been a lot of doubling mm -hmm. to meet the needs of the district and certain things, and that's time-consuming. And I'm still trying to catch up from that. And, and, and you just have to decide what's more important. Being with the teachers, like like this week, I was out ill for a, a day and a half. Well, you that really screws up your week. Yes, because does. if I'm out an hour and a half and I had two days of PLCs, that does not leave you more than a day and a half. You know, and then we had a big Thanksgiving feast that we do um, full turkeys for my fifth and sixth grade in a sit-down family style. So... Then I'm down to one day of observations, and I have to get the newsletter out with all the academic awards right. typed up, and I do that. So did I do a lot of observations then this week? No. But every single one of my teachers, though, were okay with it because I because when it came time for their feedback session, I said, guys, you know, we'll do that when we come back from the break, and I'll get caught up. But it was okay because I've always been already been in their classroom so much right. and hadn't missed any of the meetings, and I just did their deep data dives a week and a half ago. So we're okay. Do you see how you can have that moment where if you get sick, you can right. still make it up? But if you weren't in the classrooms, just think of your impact in a building if you weren't there for a day and a half. But for me, it wasn't that big of an impact because the teachers and the systems are already in place. It's okay. They're yeah. still running. And then they'll give me a little forgiveness if I'm not in their classroom when I get back on that other day. Because the trust lands report is due and the big feast. But you can't do that all the time. 
So when I get back after Thanksgiving break, because we have a week off, because we have trainings and then a week, December 2nd on that Monday, I'll be observing. That'll be my day. Because I have to show that commitment, you know. And that's one of the reasons why my teachers work hard for me, because right. I'll work hard for them. Yes, it's a partnership. Yep, and that's something that. I and then that's what we're trying to get again. our students to be in that partnership. Exactly. We're going to work hard for you, and you better work hard for yourself. Right. When every leader shows those that are working for that leader that they're willing to put in the time and effort mm -hmm. to do what needs to be done, those who are following the leader are more willing to do mm -hmm. that because they see, well, this person's job is way more difficult than mine. So if they can do it, mm -hmm. I can commit to that. Well, see, and the key is we don't compare who's harder. Mm -hmm. What's key is that we put the effort in, but you got to put the effort in the right areas. You know, it's, you have to make sure that it's the right thing that you're putting all that time into that matters and that has the biggest leverage. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of schools across the whole country where everybody's working really hard. Right. But you're just working hard on the wrong things. Mm -hmm. you got to work hard on the right things that have the biggest impact and biggest leverage. That's the data instruction. That's the observation feedback. And I throw PLCs in there. Mm -hmm. And then it's the student culture and procedures. And, boy, does it take work. It's like my counselor and I, there were days, and there still are days, if you've got a couple different classes of a teacher that you can notice – a little, a little hard, you know, because cause they struggle a little bit in that area. Mm -hmm. We go and we give them time, and we go and practice with them, and we that takes time out, yeah, you know. Sure. But that's time well spent, and it gets them back on target, and they feel supported, not in trouble, not oh people can. We come in as a team and say, "How can we help you?" Oh, if you could help with this and this, oh, we'll be there. What time today? You know, it's not rescuing them. It's partnering with them to help. They say, hey, can you model this for me? Can you help me with this? Let me see it or watch me while I do this. Give me feedback. You know, and that's how we help them. And it's an ongoing constant. That's great. And then balancing myself. Um, then the rest of my time are my kids. I go to uh, my daughter is a junior in high school, um, a great athlete. And uh, she's a three-sport student, so I do sports, a lot of sports. <laughs> and then uh, with my son and my husband, we try to do things. I give them all the time. So then that does mean when you get your other stuff done, I just prioritize what has to be done. I'll stay up late, get up early to do the things that have to be done. And if it doesn't have to be done, it gets put off another day or two. And then some things they never even asked for. Right. So it never really was a priority. You know, so you do, you have to do that. You can't make this report, this the highest priority. There are some things that are deadline and you got to plan ahead and schedule that. But the priority is your teachers and the observations and that, and then you got to fit the rest of that stuff in. And there's not very much time. Trust me. You should see my calendar. My secretary has a hard time getting IEPs, IEPs. I have an instructional coach that also has a SPED degree and a counselor. So I spread out my LEA status. So between the three of us, we can hit all the IEPs. You know, so you have to be willing to trust people. You have to be willing to build capacity and leadership amongst your teams. You cannot do everything and everywhere. So you have to build the people and build the systems and let them run. And keep checking, but you got to let them run. So you can put your time where it needs to be. And you don't have an assistant. No, right? I, I'm not a huge school. I'm only, you know, 400. Mm -hmm. But we do a lot of time. I, I, I mean, it's a high need 400. Right. And to be honest, um, and I went to 96% of all of the activities when I was at the high school and still got in classrooms and stuff. I work harder here at D. To be really honest with you, I do. I have just as long a nights. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and I'm not supervising athletic events. Right. I mean, it, 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 it's interesting. It's like I walk out of here between, you know, around 530. And then I go home, do the dinner, do the games and the sports. And then I'm doing um, all the things, preparing for the PLCs, doing the data, the feedback, whatever I need to do. So 
Had long, long nights. Long. Long mornings, early mornings, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Sometimes so, 24 hours. <laughs> I believe it. But we do it. Obviously. And it's showing great success mm -hmm. for your students, mm -hmm. for your staff, for you. And that's really awesome. Um, I do like to notice things in people's offices when I come oh, in. Mine's busy and it messy. Busy. <laughs> um, but I notice that there's a principal parking only sign uh -huh. behind you. Is there a story oh, yeah. behind that? Yes. I hate it when principals have a parking space. And so I always take it. I would never use it. And I always take it, take it down. And every school I leave, they always put it right back up. Mm -hmm. And so when I left um, Ogden High and they were rebuilding everything, I wouldn't put up a principal parking spot. You go to Ogden High, there is no principal parking spot. It's totally remodeled. There's Cook's parking spot. There's police parking spot, but no administration. And so the custodian gave it to me. And so I put it up here. Where you, you really know, park. <laughs> yeah, because I do not need a parking space. Right. You know, I, I felt that it was more important for my community right. to have the parking space. And and Because I'll walk. It's yeah. no big deal. I assume that was the story uh -huh. behind that, which uh -huh. is why I asked that. Because that, again, reiterates the culture that you're trying to establish. That you're not better or work harder or anything more special than someone else. You have the same expectation right. for yourself as you do for everyone else. And that's to help all of our kids be at or above grade level mm -hmm. by the time they leave our school. That's, and it's like, it bugs me. I go to Ben Loman high school and it's all right in front of the school. The best parking is all admit principals, vice principals that, and then the police are like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. You know? And I, I'm thinking how many people drive by that and see that? Mm hmm that irritates me. And so when I was at Ogden High, I wouldn't let them do that. Mm -hmm. And they still don't have it. So good kudos to the new principal there. That's She's good. continued that. She didn't put one up for herself. I was, I was really proud to see that Stacy didn't do that. That's good. Yeah. Um, one last question that I want to ask at the end of each of my interviews mm -hmm. is, what is one thing that a principal can do right now to change the culture in their school or to change a focus so that they can start being a transformative principal like you? You know what? They need, uh, and I don't get any money from this, <laughs> they need to read Driven by Dada by Paul Bambrick Santoyo and Leverage Leadership. As you can see, mine are very well read. Yes, very well. And pick one. You know, pick Anything one step. Um, the biggest, the two biggest things you get out of it is, um, I would say, look at... Um, getting your teams together and how to analyze data and do lesson planning from that. And then the other one, the second one is your procedures in your building. Hand in hand, you'll go far with those little two things, but it's hard. It's like, it's like my counselor. And I we just, it was so funny. We did all this work all together and our team and everything. And then I read the chapter and leverage leadership on that, mm -hmm. you know, because I had to do a presentation and I thought, oh, you know, I got to go back and look at that. And I had never read the chapter. And I went to my counselor and said, look, we didn't even read this before we did this, but look, we did step by step. <laughs> and we gave each other a high five. You know, it's just common sense and looking at research. That's the steps. Mm -hmm. And I said, we're in the right direction. It was huge affirmation for my leadership team and everyone that we were in the right direction. Right. And we had come up with it on our own from what we had already done with data and experience. So we right. said, this is a weak area. Common sense. What do we need to do with it? Mm -hmm. You know, and the research said the same thing. That's great. You know, so that's read those two books or pick one. I don't care which one. If I was a principal, um, I would start with the leverage leadership. And mm -hmm. in, in we got that second. We first got driven by data in the UVA program. Because Paul hadn't written this yet, the the, the leverage leadership right. it just came out. Start with the with the leverage leadership, and because it hits on all the seven levers, and data is one of mm -hmm. them. And then they can decide because there's little action plans that he said takes you through, and a disc. Mm -hmm. And I'd encourage them do that and decide. There's a, also an analysis of your building that you can do. Mm -hmm. Decide where is your building on this, and you decide. The next step, one or two things you're going to do. And mm -hmm. Just do it. It's like, I hate it when I hear people say, well, you know, 
that's too much change for my teachers. We need to wait, maybe next semester. Uh -huh. Oh, you know what? Oh, I don't want to rile it up. Oh, no, that's... No, that'll be next year. No, you have got to start it right now. You cannot waste any more time. Sense of urgency. That's the big thing. My teachers know with me, if it's the right thing and we need to do it right now, we're going to do it right now. Because yeah. if what we're doing isn't getting us the outcome we want, we need to adjust now. Why, mm -hmm. why keep doing it? Yeah. And so change is constant. Yeah. But it's purposeful. And I don't do things like, who, who, no, uh, it's, I am very careful to stay in the guidelines of research and what we need to do and how far my teachers can take it. How far can I push them? Then let's get this down really, really well. And I'm in it with them. Like when we did deep data dice. I'll tell you how our, our district rolled it out afterwards, but we started it with UVA. Okay. So we did a deep data dive with our interim. I didn't just um, throw them into it. Prior to that, I set aside three PLCs, three weeks of PLCs, mm -hmm. where I took them through the process and the template. We did it together, even before they had the data. We worked mm -hmm. them through it. What would this look like? What would this sound like? Do you know how to fill this out? Let's let's practice this. Mm -hmm. Then they did their um, deep their their uh, assessment, and then. So the week before we did that, then we did the assessment, then we came back, and then those two weeks we filled it in with them. Mm -hmm. And then the next, then we used that data and kept checking up on it. Do you see how? So then when the second deep data came, dive came, they were okay. Mm -hmm. They were able to do it. And even now to this day, this is our second year doing it, the PLC before the deep data dive, I recommend that they use that time to put their individual data in because I respect their time. Why expect them to do it after school if I've got them for an hour and a half? Right. What's better use of time than to put their data in so they're ready for their deep data dive discussion the next, you know, in two days? I, I honored their time. They use school time to do it mm -hmm. during their hour and a half PLC. And while they're doing it, we're having great conversation about right. why. Oh my goodness. I'm asking myself these questions. Why? And we're here and I'm helping them guide them through that. Mm -hmm. But I did not just throw them out on their own. So if you choose what to do, you have got to be the instructional leader for your people. Right. You've got to train, you've got to know how to do it mm -hmm. and, and say, say, Hey, I'm not an expert. We're going to learn this together, but you're going to take them through it and you're going to lead the PD for them. They got to see you as you know what you're doing and you're in this with them. And even if it's not perfect, it's okay because you're in this with them and you're leading them through it. So you can't just say, oh, yeah, we're going to do this. And I'm going to have my assistant do this or I'm going to have my IT do this. Uh-uh. It's got to be you have to lead it and be in it with them and help them be successful in it. Then they can run with it. And you're going to take the time for yourself and for them mm -hmm. to ensure that they're doing it right. Right. So you said the first time, three weeks preparing mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. Then they did the assessment, then another two weeks mm -hmm. to make sure it was done right. Yes. And that is a lot of time to devote. But to now we do thing. deep data dives beautifully. Right. No one can touch us. Right. Because you put in that time mm -hmm. to prepare, just like you yeah. teach them to teach their students. We do habits now, practice. Mm -hmm. So they become habits and then... Later, and it's okay to do that time. And like people think I'm insane, but you have to. Wow. What a great interview with JM. She really is doing some amazing things up at the elementary. And I'm so grateful. I got to spend some time with her and learn more about them. And I'm glad that you've been able to listen to this podcast. Please be sure to subscribe, rate us in iTunes and let everybody, you know, understand what a great podcast this is thanks so much we'll see you next week 